so pleased to introduce Glenn Nelson. Glenn Nelson is a Seattle native and founder of The Trail Posse, a news service and website that documents and encourages diversity and inclusion in the outdoors. He is a longtime national award-winning journalist for the past 15 years, has helped start and operate digital media companies. His last, Hoop Girls, was founded to empower girls and women through national coverage of basketball and was sold to ESPN. Glenn, who was Japanese American, authored Why Are Our Parks So White for the New York Times in July. Please welcome Glenn Nelson. checking you guys out the last couple days, and you are some wilderness nerds. <laughs> this is what some of your sessions were called. Preserving founding principles of the Wilderness Act in an age of collaboration and conflict resolution. Recreation and conservation nexus, colon, will growth in outdoor recreation increase demand for land protection or undermine it? No wonder this has taken place at the University of Montana. Sounds like some of the papers I had to read back in college. I know you guys were working on those titles. I'm sorry to say. I've been to conferences where the sessions are called, let's talk about shit at 2 o'clock. And I'm sorry about the language, but that's what you get for asking an urban guy to come talk to you. I was going to name my talk, Invite a Brother on a Hike. But now I think it's not impressive enough sound. So I came up with this. <laughs> Looking for diversity and inclusion in the wilderness, colon, don't miss that. Fording the impossible confluence of Caucasoids, Negroids, Mongoloids, and Native people in unspoiled natural landscapes. about you guys, this group is really white. <laughs> and I'm glad because you're exactly the people I need to talk to. Because diversity in the wilderness is a white issue. Now I mean that in the nicest possible way, believe me. This isn't one of those white guilt sessions. You're not here to pay penance for interning Japanese Americans like me or enslaving African Americans. Most, maybe all of you, are either starting or in the middle of or at the end of a lifetime uh, dedicated to wild lands. Now a lot of you are getting old, er, and now you're that generation. Aging, white, mostly male. And a lot of you are about, about to trans transition out. Not now, but sooner than later at this point. You were so dedicated to your causes that you didn't have time to think about preparing the next generation of students, for the most part. I mean, we're on a college campus, and the audience here is actually a lot different than the ones I'm used to. So, so I feel a lot of hope being here. And you all know what's at stake. Not only your legacy of lands kept unspoiled, or the opportunity for solitude, but the health of the planet, climate change carbon footprints, endangered species. So who's going to soldier on when you're gone? As things stand today, not people of color. For the vast, vast majority of us, none of this even exists. Think I'm overstating that? As was mentioned, I wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times. You may have read it. I set it up by going, reaching out to people in my neighborhood, people of color. 
I live in, I live in where I grew up in Southeast Seattle. It's the most diverse part of my city. We all live there. On my block is a prime example. On the corner is a black couple, Tommy and Adrian. They've lived, on, they've lived there for decades. Rhett and Rob, a gay couple, just moved in uh, next door on the other side. Across the street is Raquel and, G and Gerald, a mixed Filipino white couple. And in the middle of it is me, Japanese American, and my Latina wife, Florangela. And in southeast Seattle, many of our neighborhoods are named Rainer this, Rainer that. Guess why? We can see the mountain almost every day because it has to be clear to see it. We do have some clear days in Seattle. So I ask people in my neighborhood, you look at this mountain almost every day, how many of you have ever been there? All but one, one person said they've never been there. And the one person who had said she can't get her friends to come with her. Some said they were scared to go there. You know, lions and tigers and bears. Most didn't know it was up there, so the fear of the unknown. So I told them, you know, there's a national park up there. And they said, what's a national park? Is it a lawn? Are there picnic tables? See, they're equating it to what they're used to in the city. And so they wonder, why do I have to drive one two hour, or two hours for that? I can just grill up some dogs here, and here I have my own bathroom. God only knows what's up there. But really, that's only a concern when somebody brings it up. On most corners, there's massive indifference to the wilderness. And that's not just my neighbors. They're not outliers. An outlier is someone like me. This is my mom, my brother, my sister, me. My mom's from Japan, and that's where I was born. I grew up hiking and camping. My closest friend, I met the Boy Scouts. He's the one on the left, by the way. Uh, he's black, obviously, and so are a lot of others in, our, in Troop 14 in Seattle. The guy missing from the previous photo was my dad. He was our scoutmaster. And he's the guy my brother and I would tease as the white guy at the end of the table. Still, being outside with people of color seemed normal until my friend and I went to Seattle University where we had to practically drag our classmates of color out to the outdoors. And I can remember the drives out to some of our outings. There'd be nervous tension. And somebody would joke about getting lynched. And I'd look in the back seat and see my friend, David Black, who actually is black, and he'd always be humming this tune. <laughs> so good you know what that means. <laughs> so a relationship with the outdoors, that's not baked in our cultures anymore. It's been baked out. Every community of color in America can point to a negative connotation about the outdoors that's been imposed upon us by our own country. With African Americans, of course, with slavery, Japanese Americans, internship, Chinese Americans, forced labor on the railroads, Latinos, migrant work, and then there's, there's the Native Americans. They just had the outdoors snatched from them. And then they've had to suffer the indignity of having the mountains, lakes, and rivers named, renamed after white settlers who supposedly discovered them. Here's how deep this runs. I did a story on a pair of bilingual Latino interns at a national park out west. I asked them, so how do you talk to your parents about what you want to do? Nancy says, there really aren't even words. Literally, I guess. <laughs> we never talk about this in Spanish. You know, there's no discussion about going hiking. So it's una caminata. And then I asked my parents, you know, how do you say hiking? You know, what does this mean? And I like acted out, you know, they're like, oh, una caminata? Or tienda uh, de campaña? Like these words, I have never used them in Spanish because there's just no discussion about this at all in my family. And then Sal, like Nancy, is the child of immigrant parents from Mexico. 
they work two to three jobs every day in the fields to make a better world for, for their son. So they can't wrap their minds around what he's trying to do. So you choose to sleep on the floor if you like that? We started from that for you not to be doing that, and now you're doing it because you want to. So it's a weird concept for them. <laughs> does this all matter? Hell yes, it does. In two to three decades, the majority of this country is going to be non-white. There's no stopping that. Already, there are more non-white babies born every day than white babies in this country. Before you know it, most of this country is going to look like me. <laughs> Hopefully it's handsome and a little bit younger. <laughs> So if these people, the diversity people, if you will, don't have a relationship with the outdoors, what are they going to care about your wilderness? This is a self-preservation issue, pure and simple, for you, for your organizations, for your legacies, for all those decades of work, for your hopes and dreams. So where is the urgency? How long are we going to have to wait to start protecting your future? The Civil Rights Act was signed 50 years ago, and I know I'm rounding down. Same as the Wilderness Act. Where are we? How do we feel about where we are on civil rights 50 years later? How do we feel uh, about the wilderness 50 years later, for that matter? If we took that 50-year timeline, applied it on, on our planet, and say that we only get so far in 50 years, When an indifferent, non-white majority takes over in 20 to 30 years, I'm thinking this planet's cooked. Just take a look. I mean, how white can the outdoors get? I don't know if you guys know this, this is Green 2.0, uh, initiative uh, to increasing racial diversity in, in organizations. So they have found, this is some of their findings. I didn't want to read this off, I'll let you read this. But I'll say one thing. Since a study was done, the Sierra Club elected Aaron Mayer as its president. Aaron Mayer is African American. So, okay, there's one in a major organization. Going from zero to one is change, not progress. This report really, really goes on and on. And you need to read it if you haven't already. And things keep getting worse. It's been a downward trend in this regard in your world. And I keep waiting. And I keep wondering, what's going to be the tipping point? Believe me, nobody does anything about diversity and inclusion unless there's a gun to their head. In the 60s, there was black power. 50 years later, there's Black Lives Matter. People, you get people's attention, then they start saying, we better do something about this. So what's the tipping point? What's our Ferguson for the outdoors? What's our Watts? You know, burn baby burn. Come to think of it, it seemed like my home state, Washington, and the entire West was burning to the ground all summer. Last I looked, about nine and a half million acres of burn in this country in 2015. Can we finally say every life matters? I mean, if you can't breathe, it doesn't matter what color you are. The question is, are we going to be strange bedfellows or uneasy alliances? I have a white ranger friend who keeps telling me, we got to attack this with empathy and compassion. There's a great quote in this book. Uh, it's Alexis, a goat rancher. I think she's here in Montana. She says, love will save this place. I really wish that were so. But I keep saying, screw empathy and compassion. We've tried that path for 50 years and have gotten nowhere. We don't have time to struggle anymore for something we don't seem capable of obtaining. Let's start focusing on something that we must realize. Race is such a tough thing for Americans. The other day I was being interviewed by a guy, a white guy. In the middle of the interview, he stops and says, 
I'm so super conscious of saying the wrong words or asking you the wrong question. It's hard to talk about race, I know that. I covered the NBA, that's National Basketball Association for you wilderness nerds. It's a sport that happens while you're out snowshoeing and backcountry skiing. <laughs> Way back, I arranged an interview with a player named Rick Mahorn, who's black and plays with, played for the Detroit Pistons. He made me wait in front of his locker for 10 or 15 minutes while he goofed around with a couple of ball boys. Finally, he looks up and says, what you want? I remind him I had this interview schedule. So he says, well, I don't talk to no white boys. Taken aback, I said, well, what if I'm not white? And then he says, well, what are you then? And I'm like, Japanese? <laughs> and he says, well, I don't talk to no Japs neither. So we all get this. My point is, we don't have time anymore for verbally tiptoeing around each other. Let's just be honest and meet somewhere in the middle. Besides the overtly racist stuff, there are two main reactions of my New York Times piece and another piece uh, that I wrote for my hometown paper, the Seattle Times. One was, they just don't like the outdoors, and they would just rather stay in the city. As if our DNA, as if we're in our DNA to reject outdoor recreation and stewardship, which is, which is preposterous, right? The other more pervasive reaction went something like, and this is what you get about slavery or internment or any other racial wrong. I've never stopped a person of color from going to a park. Everyone's welcome. Everyone says it. Everyone's welcome. So let's talk about that a second. Fact is, you're not welcomed if you don't feel welcomed. People of color see the great outdoors as a last whites only club to which they don't and cannot belong. They don't see themselves there, literally. Carolyn Finney was in at Cal Berkeley, looked at 10 years of Outside Magazine, I'm sure you guys know that one, right? Um, she looked at almost 7,000 photos and 44 issues, 103 contained African Americans. So the country, Americans, are programmed not to expect to see minorities outdoors. And if you want to change that, you have to start making the outdoors look like a place where we feel like we belong. One of the ways is changing the way we're perceived in mass media, but there's a, there's a shorter cut. Hire people of color and don't make us tokens. One of the products of that, back to that national park out west, I met the superintendent, and when he took over, he looked through his demographics of his new park, shiny new park, to him, and his visitors were old and white, just like everywhere else he'd been. But he saw different communities spring up around his park, a brown one, and he wanted to get that new community into his park, so he assigned two of his rangers for a whole week of outreach asking Latinos to come attend their annual free picnic. And he was really proud of this until the day of the picnic, when everybody who attended was white as usual. He was lamenting this to a leader in the community later in the week. And the leader says, hmm, you sent your two rangers? And they were in uniform? The superintendent's like, gets it right away. If you didn't know, people of color and people in uniform, eh, you know. But imagine if that superintendent had had a Latino deputy and maybe another bilingual ranger. You think stuff like that would have come up in the planning stages? Well, this superintendent did get it eventually. He got those two Latino interns that you heard. He hired some bilingual staff and now he has Latino kids in his summer camps for the first time ever. Hey, I've been there too. My last project, you heard, was starting a national website covering high school girls basketball. I'm a guy. Hope you notice that. So I hired women. 
I even hired some of the players that we covered to blog for us. Who knows high school girls basketball better than a high school girl, right? And you know what? That website got so big and so successful, I sold it to ESPN. So here's my message so far. Diversity in the outdoors is a white issue. Diversity is a self-preservation issue. We've reached a tipping point like two decades ago, so there's urgency. We need to change the way the outdoors look. And to understand how to do that, we need to hire people of color. It's a pretty simple list. I often think that we overthink this, overreach, and in the process, paralyze ourselves. I get that wilderness is about isolation and being unspoiled, even untouched. But you need help protecting what you love. And people protect, and people love what they know. And you need to connect people of color, the ultimate urban tribe, to the wilderness. You need this alliance because indifference, doing nothing, is the enemy. Which leads me to this, keeping it simple. Let's find wilderness in the city. I know that doesn't seem to make any sense, but hear me out. We're talking about getting urban people to develop a relationship with the outdoors so they care about protecting and preserving it. We're talking about communities whose ties to the outdoors have been baked out of their cultures. We're talking about people who don't dedicate even a millisecond of, of awareness about the outdoors. So to start changing that, we've got to get basic. Let's find wilderness in the city. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. What does a path to the wilderness look like to a first-timer? My wife and I reconnected by hanging a bird feeder in our backyard. Then we grew native plants and created habitat, took classes, bought binoculars, spotting scope, camera gear. Then we went traveling to wildlife refuges, national parks, and yes, wilderness areas. And you know what? We care now. And that wasn't that hard. All we did was step outside of our house. Maybe we ought to bought, buy a, a million bird feeders and hang, and hand them out. I don't know. But let's find wilderness in the city first, or we may ne never find it again. Here's the main thing. Do something now. Anytime anyone says, diversity is a priority, we're talking about it all the time. I hear this all the time. So I say, well, what are you doing about it? I'm not laying out the following for sympathy, but here's what I've done. I'm two years into the trail posse. I worked on it full time. I paid myself, paid all my travel, paid all my expenses. So I'm about six figures into it. I downsized my house and turned down jobs. And the kicker is, I gave up my season tickets to the ballet. <laughs> no, that's not funny. And literally, the, those seats were so good, my neighbor's Paul Allen, right? I gave those up. And now here I am, and I'm really honored to be here, and thank you for, for bringing me here. Keynoting for the first time in my life, did you notice? <laughs> talking about something I care deeply about, and I know most of you do too. So please, don't turn us into check marks on some lists. Do something meaningful. If there's not a line item in your budget, you're not serious about diversity. It's not funding, it's an investment in our future. Not putting your money where, where your mouth is, in the hood is called fronting. <laughs> Some of you may know that as posing. Don't be a poser. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope some of my next stories will be about some of your efforts. Please let me know what you're doing. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, as we kind of wrap up, I think it's worth giving a round of applause again to all of the organizers who put in a bunch of time to make this all happen. And I think it's worth also giving a round of applause to yourselves. I know how difficult it is with travel and schedules and from all the parts across the country that we've come for all of you to be here for these days to share and spend this time. Thank you to all of you. So thank you. And with that, I think we wrap up our workshop. And I hope it's not too presumptuous to say we will see you in 2016. Bill reminds me, for those of you who remember, we have field trips tomorrow, so make sure you know all the details of where you're going and where you'll be. So have a safe and good evening. <laughs>